Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jamie. I'm the Head of Advocacy and Communications for Breast Cancer Foundation. And I'm so glad that all of you can join us this afternoon for this um, panelist session. Our very first BCF in conversation with entitled Saves Breast, Saves Lives, brought to you by our very good sponsors, uh, AstraZeneca, Hologic, as well as Specialist Women's Imaging Clinic. Breast Cancer Foundation, as we call ourselves BCF, is a non-profit social service agency that advocates for early detection of breast cancer and supports the breast cancer community here in Singapore. We're very privileged to have with us today two speakers to share with us the importance of early detection and how we can take charge of our breast health. The second segment of today's session will be a panelist discussion um, and a guest panelist who will also share some insights on how we can be protected financially as well. But first, let's begin with our first speaker, Dr. Ramesh Danovani, consultant breast radiologist and medical director for Specialist Women's Imaging Clinic. Dr. Ramesh is a radiologist with a subspecialty practice in breast imaging and intervention. He's also an avid educator and researcher contributing to radiology residency locally as well as supervising foreign breast imaging trainee from around the region. Let's put our hands together to welcome Dr. Ramesh. Thank you very much, Jamie, and thank you very much, everyone, for attending this session. Um, to be honest, I'm very, very excited to be doing this because it's actually our first um, engagement with BCF that is after the whole virtual pandemic situation. So it's the first time to be back on stage and on live and nice to see uh, everyone in person again. So uh, I'll just briefly introduce myself uh, to just to elaborate a little bit more. I'm Dr. Ramesh Danovani and I'm a uh, breast radiologist by profession. And that means that we are radiologists are doctors that look at your scans and come up with diagnosis. So I'm essentially a breast diagnostician and we use both imaging as well as biopsies to come up with a specific diagnosis for your breast disease. So um, today I'll be talking about uh, focusing on screening mammography because this is what it is all about, especially all the galleries that you see in terms of the pictures that you see. These ladies are cancer survivors and uh, part of the reason why they're cancer survivors is because they take charge of their breast health, they detect early and they treat it early and that's the whole point that we are trying to advocate. So uh, we'll look at some facts and figures, some statistics. I'll try to get through that as fast as I can, and then we'll focus on mammography. What does it do exactly? And then I'll try to um, illustrate what happens to you in the process of obtaining a mammogram. Um, so this is Singapore's breast cancer landscape. If you notice, uh, this is one of the latest data. If you notice, the top most cancer is breast cancer. Obviously, I think we all know that, but how much is it exactly? This is how much it is. It's literally double the volume of the second commonest cancer, colon cancer. So it is really by miles ahead of even the second cancer. Uh, by age incidence, um, there is a little bit of talk or mentions with regards to younger breast cancer. We do see a little bit more of younger breast cancer here in Asian populations or even in Singapore populations, but by and large, it is uh, affecting the middle age, 50 to 65 kind of age group. And this is the trend over the years since we collected data in Singapore from 1970 to uh, the latest one on top. There is increasing pickup breast cancers, whether that is due to uh, inherent increasing um, occurrences or whether it is because we detect more of the breast cancers. Over the years, there is also improvement in terms of detecting by stage, stage one, two, three, and four. We are detecting more of stage one disease lately, which is good, but we still need to improve a little bit on that. So early detection is key because um, it is the commerce cancer um, but at the same time, where we will look at it slightly later on, the survival is fantastic if you detect it early. And then it has been shown that survival can be as high as uh, close to 100% if you detect it at stage 1 disease. So that's the whole point. Now, uh, risk factors for breast cancer, there's, there's quite a lot, but we generally speaking would... Uh, uh, divide the categorize the, the the different risks based on low or average risk, medium risk, or high risk. Now, patients with high risk are, uh, I think, is uh, pretty much clear cut in a sense that, for example, uh, everyone knows about uh, the um, uh, that, that that actress. 
uh, that has known genetic mutation, everyone knows about that. That is an example of known high-risk disease, and those patients undergo a select kind of um, screening approach. But for average risk, what are your risks, meaning for just average lady in the population? And the risk we're talking about if you have modifiable or non-modifiable risk. Um, now, even the non-modifiable ones, even the modifiable ones are not that easy to modify, but they can be a little bit of a risk. Now, just bear in mind that these are not proven cause and effect kind of factors, but these are correlations or what patterns that scientists or data scientists see. Um, excessive alcohol intakes, excessive weights, and prolonged exposure to exogenous hormones. For example, you are taking hormones externally due to various causes, such as hormone replacements or, or a contraception. These could all contribute to it. Um, exposing your breasts to the female hormones in some of the breast cancers are hormone sensitive, meaning they pick up on the hormones and they grow on it. So this is an example of the risk factors in average population. Now, by and large, though, there is very little you can do about prevention. Um, you might be able to uh, kind of um, pick it up early and try to treat it earlier. But in terms of preventing it, there's very little that you can do about that. So which is why we are advocating mammography in a sense that um, it has been shown uh, to be able to detect cancers early. Uh, now, the use of mammograms is um, obviously uh, very commonplace now, and in fact, it is the main modality that is being used in many national screening programs. Excuse me. For example, in Singapore, we are lucky to have the national screening program called the Breast Screen Singapore program. Uh, we are probably one of the very, very few Asian countries that has this um, organized national program. Um, there are other European countries, Australia, uh, North American countries as well that do have these, and these are based on mammography. Um, they are not usually involving ultrasound or other modalities, and this is because mammography has been proven in many countries to be able to work very well in terms of picking up the cancers earlier. Um, now, it's been proven to also provide the uh, benefit of a uh, survival benefit by up to 40% in many studies. And of course, uh, for that individual person, if you detect the cancer early, there is additional benefit in terms of treatment as well. Now, the five-year survival benefit, uh, so five-year survival for breast cancer, if detected at localized disease, meaning stage one or even stage two disease, is coming close to 100%, which is 99%, as compared to distant stage disease, meaning if the disease has spread, it will be as low as 27%. So, in essence, breast cancer is, is, is quite a manageable disease if, if the patient's cancer is picked up early enough. Um, it is certainly not, as a clinician, um, anecdotally, I can share with you that it is certainly not the most aggressive form of cancer that you would encounter. It is not a cancer that would literally automatically uh, be known as a death sentence kind of cancer. For example, pancreatic cancer, where your your life expectancy drastically drops upon diagnosis. So, so breast cancer, there is still things you could do about it. And because it is so common, uh, perhaps you might want to be able to help yourself in, in, in uh, getting some of these survival benefits by detecting it early. Now, in case some of you are not familiar with uh, what mammograms are all about, so the next couple of slides will be trying to illustrate uh, what this is. Mammograms basically are x-rays of the breast. I, I think some of you may have come across uh, or may have had uh, chest x-rays or you broke a limb. You may have had um, a elbow x-ray, leg x-ray. So mammograms are x-rays of the breast. So it will come up in black and white uh, image like this. Uh, so basically what happens is the breast is exposed to x-rays and then the, um, the detector will pick up on the outcome on the other side of the exposure and then it will then be processed and it will form image. And the images are now digitally sent to us, uh, breast radiologists, to look on the display monitors and then we'll then come up with diagnosis. So if you look at the, the furthest image where there are two ladies there, so that's typically what happens in a mammogram room. Um, you have the mammography technician or mammographer who is trying to handle the breast. The breast is usually compressed if you see the... Okay, so 
Now, this is the um, X-ray tube that will be emitting the X-rays downwards toward the breast. And then this white uh, item here is the compression paddle. And this black item over here is the detector. So this is the detector that receives the X-rays coming out of the breast. And it will produce these images here. will then send to the radiologist for interpretation. So this is what I do on a daily basis. Now, you may have come across... 3D mammography as well, 2D versus 3D, is not really a a, 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 um, uh, <clears throat> a big jump in terms of modality or advances, but basically 3D mammograms is just an extension of 2D mammograms. It is still all under the realm of mammography. It's just, for example, if you have a CT scanner that is 32 slices versus a CT scanner which is 64 slices. So the more slices you do, the more you'd be able to have in terms of images and diagnostic information. So that's the difference between 2D and 3D. Now, 3D mammography has been shown to increase cancer detection rate and reduction in recall rate, which I will explain slightly later on. So this is an example of um, image. The image on the left-hand side here is the usual 2D mammogram, and the image on the right-hand side here is 3D mammograms. This is actually a video that is very, very slowly uh, progressing, so you can't really detect probably. But basically, it is showing the breast from layer to layer, from skin to skin. It's every one millimeter we get information off. So um, this would uncover small cancers, for example. So this is what we do for 3D mammography. And this is also an example of 3D mammograms using a rose as analogy. And um, basically, um, you could see the internal structure of, of the rose easier with multiple exposures compared to taking one single exposure of the rose from the front. Uh, so this analogy works uh, in our practice as well. So basically, um, it will reduce the effect of tissue superimposition, which is a very, very important disadvantage of regular 2D mammography. But whatever it is, uh, do discuss with your doctors, whether 2D or 3D or whatever, it is still within the realm of mammography. Mammography as a modality is the one that has been shown to detect cancers early. This is an example of how it is actually being done. This machine here is what you saw earlier on, where the lady was having the breast compressed. Um, and then this is how the breast is being compressed. This pink structure here, the pink structure is the breast. This is the compression paddle and this is the detector. So the X-ray exposes the breast from the top and then it will then be detected by the detector over here. Now, what do we look at? Um, what we do we try to see? The image on the left-hand side is an example, a very, very obvious example. I think you don't need to be a radiologist to see that there is a cancer here because the rest of the breast is quite unremarkable as compared to this part. But sometimes we also look at what is called as microcalcifications, um, and that is shown here as uh, a few dots of crystals. I don't know if you could see these. These are examples of microcalcifications, especially in some low-grade cancers or stage zero cancers. They can present in this manner. Now, I would like to share with you that usually if they are in the form of microcalcifications, they are not palpable, meaning you cannot feel it. These are very, very tiny structures. In fact, they are approximately 0.05 microns. Uh, it is unlikely that you could feel it with your fingers. So if you can't feel it with your fingers, but you have that cancer, what does that translate in terms of picking up the cancers early? So therein uh, lies the rationale of, of, of justifying doing early detection, because by the time you could feel it, by the time these things grow from 0 0.05 microns to become one centimeters, or the average size of you feeling the, a lump in the breast is usually about two centimeters, which is stage two disease. So stage 2 disease versus stage 0 disease. I think it goes without saying. Now, in Singapore, our screening mammography recommendation is ladies aged 40 to 49 is uh, once yearly and those aged 50 and above one, once every two years. And this follows the Breast Screen Australia program as well. Now, I think um, maybe the next couple of slides will be uh, addressing the um, mammography journey. Uh, what would you expect to encounter or to experience when obtaining a mammogram? But first and foremost, do get the right information. 
um, try not to get information from, you know, friends who, who are maybe untrained or may not be fully aware. Get the right information on why Memgram is good for you. Uh, maybe even consult BCF if you are not sure. Uh, because uh, there's a lot of myth um, or rather false news regarding uh, mammography, which is unfair on mammography side. But when you are considering it, please uh, use the right level of information and discuss with your doctors you know, what approach you should need in terms of obtaining screening. Now, if you and your doctor are now comfortable to obtain screening mammograms, do make a booking and then um, upon the day of uh, arrival at the mammography clinic, just make sure that um, you are not wearing jewelries and uh, talcum powder, for example, because these may affect the image that is being produced. The radiographer usually will take you through um, what to expect on the day itself. Um, usually she will be asking screening questions. For example, do you have any breast history, any breast surgery before, or do you have any family history? So um, don't, don't find that as intrusive. Just think of it as being very, very useful, for, especially for diagnosticians like us, um, in order to see uh, uh, or make the right interpretation when we see the image. And then after that, she will then take you to the mammography room that we saw earlier. And I've reproduced this here as well, the mammography room. And then she will ask you to expose your breast and then she will then compress your breast. Now, um, why does it need compression? This compression is a little bit of an issue for some patients, but by and large, most patients are quite comfortable, but some patients do ask, why is there a need for compression? Now, compression is important because the breast is a pendulous structure. It's an appendage. Its position changes. Sometimes its shape changes, even during the month of uh, throughout the uh, menstrual cycle, it changes as well, inconsistencies and so on. So it's very important to fix it in place so that we can get full view of the entire breast. That's one thing. Secondly, um, if the breast is not compressed, the amount of radiation that goes in and uh, to compare that with uh, adequate or accurate diagnostic information can be a little bit tricky. So we need to minimize the amount of radiation that goes in and provides the best level of diagnostic information in just single shot. So medical imaging is usually like that. We want to minimize radiation that, that you receive and then we want to maximize the diagnose, diagnostic information that we can get. So these are the four basic views uh, that we have, two for the right, two for each breast, actually, RCC, LCC, RMLO, and LMLO. So the breasts are positioned in these manners, so they will be compressed in these manners. You can, you can imagine this lady here having each of these views. Each view may take about a um, couple of seconds, maybe around three seconds or less. So altogether, it'll be about um, a f just a couple of minutes. Uh, of, of course, preparation before that and preparation afterwards uh, will give you a couple of minutes more. So the total examination time in a very smooth, straightforward case, only four view requirement is maybe around 10 minutes max. Um, now, bear in mind that these are basic views. Uh, radiolog we, the radiologist seeing it may not have seen your views before, and additional views may have to be performed. So out of these, what are the outcome? Uh, now, after you have come out of the mammography room, I'm sure you are thinking a lot, what, what, what did the radiologist see? I wonder if there is indeed cancer, or blah, blah, blah. So this usually is an important um, element of a breast uh, patient in which there is a lot of anxiety involved and most places will try to uh, expedite the outcome of a screening mammography. Now there are four general groups of, of outcomes. Um, obviously normal is clear, uh, there is no concerns there. Benign is there is an abnormality but the radiologist is not concerned, is not um, a crucial or significant abnormality. We're just going to leave it. So we call these as benign, or sometimes you may say it is BIRETS2. That means we'll just leave it be, nothing to do. Now, the third group is the difficult group because it is called recall for assessment because there is something there we are not certain about. A huge portion of this, about 70 to 80%, are actually negative. So they are false positive. Upon further assessment, they turn out to be negative. So 80% of patients who are recalled still have a good chance of it not being cancer. So don't be too alarmed if you get recalled necessary. Of course, you need to be concerned and do go for it. Because don't skip it because there might indeed be something there. But the vast majority of patients are cleared after that. 
Now, obviously, if you happen to be the unfortunate ones, it may indeed be malignant right from the start. Even from the four basic views, sometimes we can see a clear-cut malignant case. So what happens to you when you're recalled for assessment? You will be recalled for further imaging. There are various other mammographic views that we could do in order to view certain parts of the breast. We may also um, ask for additional ultrasound imaging to be done as well. Now, usually from these, the radiologist would be able to decide if it is clear or not, and then 80% gets discharged. Now, the balance, 20%, usually will need further biopsies. So this is what happens from suspicious to malignant going to biopsy. Obviously, if a patient is already malignant from the start, she will need completion imaging because um, we need to stage the disease, and then we need also tissue diagnosis as well. So that's where biopsy is. Now, biopsy is extremely crucial in, 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 in uh, breast diagnostics because without a biopsy, uh, we will not know what we are dealing with. Uh, we just have the appearance of the lesion, but we don't know what that lesion is. So biopsy is part and parcel of a breast worker. And then after that, if it is a borderline lesion, you get treated, or if it is indeed malignant, you'll get treated for that as well. Okay? Um, so that's, in general, what happens to you through your mammography journey. Now, I just want to take you through some of the myths that I frequently hear from patients. Maybe I'll read out, read out some of these. Um, now, some patients say, I feel very well, so I don't need a mammogram. Some patients say, I will end up with breast cancer if I go for mammograms. Some patients say, my breast self-examination is normal, so I don't need to, do, to go for mammograms. Uh, none of my family members have breast cancer, so I won't get it. My first mammogram was normal, so I don't need to go for it anymore. Or I've had ultrasound scan, which was normal, so I'm safe. So these, these are the commonest ones. Um, now, the general theme is, is with regards to, I think, um, interpreting it is more in terms of um, uh, having a false sense of protection. You have had something that was normal, or you've examined yourself and it's normal. Your doctor has examined your breast, and uh, he's, he said that it's normal. Um, but we mustn't forget that that is just a one-off uh, at that point in time, and that doesn't mean that you don't need repeated tests, even if it is a breast examination. Both breast examinations need to be repeated. It's not a one-time thing, and that's the same with mammography. Uh, the analogy would be uh, if you were to get a blood pressure test, for example, it's not just a one-off today. Uh, you don't have high blood pressure. It doesn't mean that in five years' time you won't get it if you're not you know, watching your lifestyle, your diet, and so on. So uh, the same thing with mammograms. Um, the first mammogram being normal, you should continue to obtain more mammograms as per national recommendations. Secondly, there is a false sense of protection that if you don't have a family history or if none of your family members have breast cancer, that you will be protected. But you must remember that there are various things that are about you that can be very different from your family members, even your hair color or your eye color. Uh, your predisposition towards certain diseases will be different, even though you come from the same gene pool and you're not automatically protected. Um, number two, 85% of um, breast cancer cases arise without a known family history. So only 15% is genetic related. Uh, so therein lies the need to be mindful of a screening mammography and to keep going for it. Um, now, how about some ladies who say that ultrasound is negative, but ultrasound, maybe if I should show you an example. This is an example of an ultrasound image. And as you could see, it is very, very different from a mammogram image. So it's entirely different camera. Um, so it gives us different information. Some diseases that are visible on ultrasound are not really clearly visible on mammogram and vice versa. Now, so far, the diseases in terms of breast cancer, the um, uh, breast malignancies have been found to be better detected on mammograms because it could detect, detect the tiny micro calcifications that I showed you earlier. And those things are very, very hard to see on ultrasound, it's, it's almost impossible sometimes. But anyway, um, is there another a type of modality that we do do recommend is breast MRI, for example. It is a, a test that is recommended for those with very, very high risk, those with known genetic mutation, but that's not part of general population recommendation. Plus it's very, very expensive. So there's no point going for breast MRI if you are at average risk. Okay, so I think um, I will stop there. The take-home message would be that to please speak to your physicians, 
get the right information and check with them with regards to your relevant risk factors and how you want to go about detecting breast cancer early. And you would want to do that because not only is it common, but it's a manageable disease if you catch it early. So that's that's the take home message. OK, so with that, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. We'll now introduce to you our second speaker for today, and that's Ms. Susan Lin, General Manager for Breast Cancer Foundation. Susan has served in the, the social service sector for more than 30 years, and she understands the challenges faced in the community. Being involved in cancer prevention in, initiatives in the last eight years, she continues to enhance the advocacy of breast cancer awareness and the importance of early de detection here at Breast Cancer Foundation. Let's welcome Susan, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our In Conversation uh, today. As you can see from the screen, indicated very clearly that in February, the World Health Organization announced that breast cancer has overtaken lung cancer as the most common type of cancer in the world. How's the situation like in Singapore? Three in ten cancer diagnosed in women are actually breast cancer, and six ladies are diagnosed having breast cancer every day. So the question now is, does breast cancer only affect older women? The answer is obviously no. One in six of the breast cancer cases diagnosed in Singapore are actually for women under 45 years of age. As you can see from these statistics as indicated, about 75% of these ladies are in the age range 50 years and above with a balance of 25% uh, below 50 years old. Early detection saves lives, saves breasts is our motto, the advocacy message that we have been bringing around in the community to encourage more people to take up mammography as well as breast self-examination, which I'm going to cover later on. Okay. So although the figures are quite scary in that sense that uh, there are more people being detected having breast cancer, the encouraging part here is the five-year survival rate has improved significantly over the years. So as you can see from here, there's a 32% improvement in the survivorship rate. So Dr. Ramesh has covered earlier on on mammograph, uh, mammogram screening and uh, as indicated here, Right, ladies, 40 years, right up to about 49 years of age, they are only required to do mammogram once a year. Whereas those who are older, 50 years and above, they are encouraged to do it once in two years. Right. So the common question asked by a lot of ladies is, what happened in between? Right. So what can I do in between before I'm due for my next mammogram? Right. So the answer is simply. Just do your breast self-examination on a regular basis. So for those who are 20 years, uh, right up to maybe, uh, you know, say for example, 50 or so, while you're menstruating, so you can do the breast self-examination on the 7th to the 10th day from the start of the menstrual cycle. And for those who have menopause, you can actually choose a nice date in any month, right, and keep it as a constant and monitor from there, right? So what is this all about? Okay, let's take a look. So basically, these are the regular um, tests that any women 20 years and above are able to do on their own, in their own comfort of the home. You can do this in the shower, on the bed, you know, in front of the mirror. So basically, three basic steps, all right? So with the arm raised, as indicated there, right, and uh, three of your finger pads, right? You just move around your breast in a circular manner, all right, for about 10, some may take about 15 minutes to detect whether there's any abnormalities on either one or both of your breasts, right? Later on, we have a video that will show you in greater detail how this is done, so you will have, a, you know, a clearer understanding if you have not been doing so. Now, this is very important because, um, you know, during such uh, monthly uh, uh, examination, you will find that some ladies actually detected, uh, you know, lumps or pains and so forth, okay? These are the common things that you may notice, right? Such as bloody discharge, dimpling, a lump in the armpit. Random lumps also is possible. Then limb discharge, 
nipple inversion, skin rash, texture change, and unusual pain, right? So during the self-examination, if any of this is being detected, right, it's very critical that a doctor needs to be consulted. Don't wait for your next uh, mammogram screening. Just go and consult your doctor to find out what happening all right so it may or it may not be cancer your doctor will be the best party to advise okay so later on yeah, as i mentioned get hold of one of this uh, card and you will notice that we actually have a calendar at the back for you to fill up the spaces right so what we are encouraging is for ladies age 20 and above to if you are menstruating so then you have to uh, do your self-test uh, 7 to 10 days from the start of your menstrual cycle. But of course, for those ladies who have actually menopause, then you just pick any one day in the month, all right, and stick to that one day so that it's easier to remember, and then you continue doing your self-test, all right, or self-examination, right? So on a regular basis, such can definitely save life. It helps you detect early also. We have a video here for you to see to understand better how to do a breast self-examination. Let's watch the video together. All women are at risk of getting breast cancer and the chances of developing it increases with age. <coughs> but we also know that early detection can save lives. Empower yourself and the women you love with the gift of early detection. Here's how to do it. Here is how you can conduct breast self-examination or BSE in short. If you're menstruating, do the BSE 7 to 10 days after the start of your menstruation. It's simple. Just give your breasts some TLC. Touch, look, check. Begin by lying on your back. Place your right hand behind your head. With the pads of the middle index and ring fingers of your left hand, gently yet firmly press down using small motions to examine the entire right breast. Use any of the following patterns you're most comfortable with to ensure you've covered all of the breast tissue. Next, sit or stand and feel your armpit because breast tissue extends to that area. Gently squeeze the nipple, checking for discharge. Repeat the process on the left breast. Now, stand in front of the mirror with your arms by your side. Look at your breasts directly and in the mirror. Look out for the signs of breast cancers, which include 1. A painless lump in the breast or armpit. 2. Rashes around the nipple. 3. Discharge from the nipple. 4. Changes in the skin over the breast or nipple. 5. Retraction or pulling in of the nipple. Also note the shape and the outline of each breast. Check to see if the nipple turns inward. Do the same with your arms raised above your head. If you find changes or anything new in consecutive self-examinations, highlight it to your healthcare provider right away. They will then advise you of the next steps forward. Breast self-examination, just 15 minutes each month, can save lives and breasts. Be proactive about your health. BSE should always be coupled with regular mammogram screening for your age group. Help spread the word to all women you love. Encourage and remind them to take precautions suitable for their age. For more information about BSE, log on to www.bcf.org.sg. So the card, as I mentioned just now, actually shows you the common problems that a lot of ladies may encounter, as well as you know uh, the various steps involved to do a self-examination. So for those of you who may want to do a quick scan, you may also use this QR code here to do a scan and be able to understand the steps better so that you can share this to your loved ones, to your friends. What I'm going to share with you next is a short clip from the uh, recent launch of our Ahead of Time photo exhibitions of the cancer survivors. Right? We, are, we were honoured to have our health minister join us for that particular evening to launch this exhibition, a very meaningful exhibition which will go digital uh, after the end of June, right? from July right up to December. So let's hear from our minister. If we just be more aware 
of the threats and risk around us of various diseases, we take early action. It costs little, but it can avert so much pain and suffering. You can now be assured, whatever you do now on preventive care, on breast cancer, is now the top agenda of MOH. I've come to the end of my presentation. So should you have more questions about breast cancer and how to prevent it and so forth, please come forward and contact us at the Breast Cancer Foundation. You can follow us on our Instagram, on our Facebook, as well as visit us on the website. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for the very insightful um, sharing about breast self-examination. We'll now move on to the second segment of today's session, which is actually a panelist discussion among uh, the panelist guest speakers that we have had earlier. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Ms. Vivian Lim, the lead curator of TEDx Singapore, co-founder of Jen. She's a very talented um, community builder and was selected among the Obama Foundation inaugural leaders for Asia Pacific in 2019. Let's put our hands together to welcome Vivian. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, and thank you so much uh, to the Breast Cancer Foundation for um, inviting me. So for this segment, I'd like to invite um, our speakers. Uh, you know, we've heard them share a lot about, you know, um, uh, the breast cancer, about preventive measures, about what the foundation is doing. So we'll invite them up um, to share with us a little bit more. So uh, can we have uh, Dr. Ramesh uh, and Susan back uh, on stage with us here, please? Thank you. And I would also like to welcome um, another guest, uh, Ms. Emily Wong, who is the Chief Operating Officer of FWD Singapore. Just to shed a bit more light as well, other than from medical point of view, um, foundation point of view, uh, in terms of financial as well, what can we do um, you know, when it comes to breast cancer? So a uh, warm welcome to the three of you. Thank you for spending Saturday with yeah. us today. Yep. So um, I'm going to start with uh, you, Susan, because just now you mentioned a lot of things that you know Breast Cancer Foundation has been doing and, uh, and this exhibition as well. So to those that are starting in online, um, you guys should really come down and visit the exhibition as well and see what BCF has been working for the community. Uh, so my first question is, Susan, you know, um, yeah, BCF has been a great support for the community in this aspect. aspect. Um, can you share with us a little bit more about what are some of the uh, um, uh, things, initiative that BCF has been doing to support the Breast Cancer Foundation, uh, Breast Cancer Community here in Singapore? Sure. Good afternoon. Um, okay, as you know, this is our 25th anniversary, right? So we have been advocating uh, breast cancer awareness and uh, you know early detection for the last 25 years. Right. So uh, as you know, we can't be doing this alone. Right. So we definitely need corporates and individuals to support us in the course. So what do we do for people, you know, uh, whether they're newly diagnosed or simply wanting to find out more because they're caregivers. So we actually are located, as you can see at, on the screen, at the Breast Cancer Centre. This is the first Singapore uh, Breast Cancer Centre and we are located in St. Min Avenue, right? So all are welcome to find out more information and over at this place, we also offer services and programs for cancer survivors, right? Uh, so we, we, we offer quite a whole range, as you can see, support group and uh, even unique programs such as week loan, right? Uh, as you know, uh, because when people undergo chemotherapy, they may lose their hair, at least during the period of their treatment. So uh, in case they need some help, this is one place that they can seek help from and a whole variety of other uh, services and programs. Okay, so feel free to contact us to find out more. Yes. I remember I was there at the opening, uh, you know, and it's really so incredible to have such presence of a community space within um, Sin, in, in the estate like Sinmin as well. Um, so, you know, just wondering as well, what about the community at large? Um, what are some of the activities that BS, BCF has been working on? Um, I recall there's always the signature Pink Ribbon Walk annually. Uh, you know, what about outreach to a larger community? Yes, we do have our Pink Ribbon Walk, a very signature annual event, and we're having it very soon in October as well. Feel free to take part and join us and uh, you know, support, in our, support us in this advocacy effort, right? So other than that, you will notice, as I mentioned briefly just now, we have uh, exhibitions like what you just saw, a photo exhibition uh, that talks about the 
survivors and their journey and their inspirational story. So besides this, we do have very regular talks to the community. And uh, the, if you look at the next screen, you will notice we even have the very iconic pink building. And, and I know a lot of people are very much aware of this. So during the month uh, of October, which is our uh, BCAM as we call it, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, right? Many, many buildings are up in pink, okay? So remind us on the importance of breast health. That's really incredible. I love how, you know, it's a mix of advocacy, providing support for breast cancer patients and survivors, uh, and also all these talks and sessions and inviting people like Dr. Ramesh, who shared so many helpful information. Like I was actually learning so much about mammograms as well. I thought I knew enough, but, you know, during the session, I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't see it from that point of view. And truthfully, you know, um, if, if you guys want to find out more about BCF has been doing, please follow um, them on socials. There's more of such activities as well. And look out for Breast um, Cancer Awareness Month in October. Um, so, you know, on this note of sharing learnings uh, and letting the community learn more, um, Dr. Ramesh, just now you mentioned a lot about the benefits of screening uh, of mammograms. Um, I do have one question, uh, you know, and it's probably for the younger audiences in the crowd, because we know that, you know, for our parents' generations, um, you know, yes, it's something that it should be regularly um, done. Uh, but is there any medical reason uh, for below 40? Why, um, you know, below 40 are not as encouraged to do? Um, yeah, or am I wrong? I can be super, in I'm, I think I'm very oh ignorant. <laughs> Yeah, Thanks about this the question. So we do we do encounter this question fairly often in clinical practice. Um, there are younger ladies, and we do anecdotally also see there's a rising trend or more and more younger breast cancers that we see. But still, as Susan has shared in the statistics, the overall volume is not really that high for us to warrant a mass recommendation to every woman there is in the population below the age of 40 to go for mammography. That is one thing. Secondly, is there is not only just cost, but there is also radiation involved. Um, so in medical, uh, medical advisory, we are a little bit careful and we would want more um, research data to back recommendations if there is recommend uh, if there is radiation involved, because uh, let's not forget these are healthy ladies. Um, so we cannot just simply make recommendations when there is radiation. Um, but uh, having said that, it is very important to discuss your risk factors with your doctors. Uh, let your doctors decide what is the best way, because there are some role for mammography, even in select high risk groups, even if you are below the age of 40. That's, that's one thing. Secondly, um, there is no doubt about doing breast self-examination or having your breast checked using ultrasound for example your doc your doctor may recommend that or if not it's a what um susan was mentioning the self-examination yes right yeah, that, yes. Um, we that's do. very important i yeah. see um and just wondering as well i'm sure um, a lot of the patients will come to you and say uh does it hurt the mammogram so how usually would be the uh, I, i'm sure many people have asked this question but yes. just asking you know the, and calling out the elephant in the room <laughs> how do you usually explain it to them about the fear and the mindset yeah uh, by and large the patients are quite comfortable um it's a it's, it's a misconception um there is of course compression involved and that's very transient maybe a couple of seconds but they are usually not in the form of sharp stabbing pain they are not excruciating they are more like pressure discomfort obviously i can't say this firsthand <laughs> Um, but it is based from what my patients have have told me so it's, it's very very unusual to see a patient crying with the because of the pain for example that almost doesn't happen so and, and I like how just now you, you identified that it's just 10 minutes, right? The whole <laughs> procedure. So I think that that removes a lot of the fear. I, I'm sure, you know, BCF, you would have questions like that, right? As you do awareness and outreach, um, uh, women generally are also a bit fearful when it comes to uh, encouraging them for mammogram checks. Uh, yes, they are fearful, especially the elderly ones who have not gone, right? So that's why uh, over at 
uh, BCF, we also tap on social media to reach out to the young ladies so that you can encourage your mothers, your aunts, or even your, your older sisters to come forward for your mammogram uh, screening, right? It is not as painful or scary as it sounds, right? So doctor already assured us of that, yes. Mm -hmm. And I guess all of us here who are listening to this information can also be advocates, yeah. right? And tell people, no, I heard it from Dr. Ramesh, yeah. it's not painful. <laughs> Right. Thank you. Um, you know, just dialing it to the financial side of things, of course, understanding medical and uh, psychological fear um, when it comes to uh, the financial state of things. Right. Um, of course, if uh, we go a little extreme when it comes to recovery from breast cancer, um, you know, from a financial standpoint, that's why I'm tapping. I'm looking at you, Emily. From, you're from FWD. I'm sure you have met or heard enough case studies like that. So, you know, what should um, one look out for when it comes to ensuring that they are financially prepared? Now that they are mentally, medically, everything prepared, what about financial preparedness? Uh, thank you, Vivian, uh, for that question. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I think this question is, uh, is about, you know, how much is enough, right? How much coverage is enough for, uh, to prepare for critical illness? So if you were to approach any financial advisors, they will advise you that uh, you require uh, three to four times of your annual salary, okay? According to Life Insurance Associations, they recommended $316,000 for a critical illness cover, but not many of us actually have that amount. Um, the reason why the amount was recommended was because on average, a person would take about five years um, to be fully recovered and return to, to work. Having said that, financial planning is actually a customized process. Um, it actually are customized to each individual needs. So it depends on the family status, uh, the financial commitment, uh, whether the person actually has already had a, a comprehensive medical cover that will pay for the treatment cost, uh, as well as the lifestyle that you know um, this person would like to maintain uh, during the period that he's ab not able to work. There are two types of insurance policy that are very important to us. The first one is actually uh, medical insurance that pay for the medical hospitalization as well as reimburse the cost of treatment like chemo. The second type is actually a critical illness cover that pay a lump sum of payment um, when a person actually is diagnosed with critical illness. I'd like to share with you uh, some important points that you should look out for. Uh, the, uh, these are questions that you should ask your financial advisor when you purchase a critical illness cover. The first one is understanding of the coverage. Um, in the market, there are a few types of critical illness cover. There's early stage critical illness, there's severe stage critical illness, or some policy even cover both of them. So it's important for you to understand that what you purchase and you have to understand the definition of it as well as you know how many critical illness is covered under the policy. The second point is actually understanding on the waiting period. Waiting period is actually a period which um, insurance uh, claims is not payable if let's say the condition is diagnosed within that period. Generally, um, Waiting periods is 90 days from policy inceptions. Uh, some policy may offer slightly a, a shorter waiting period, though it is good for the insured, but the premium should be higher. The third is actually exclusion. Exclusion is actually um, a situation that the, the insurance company does not pay the claims. Um, there are two types of exclusion. There's general exclusion, which applies to everybody. Um, to, just to quote a few, it's like suicide clause or self-inflicted injury clause. There is also specific exclusion that applies to a particular individual because of the person's uh, health conditions. So the last point is actually on the coverage as barry age. So um, we need to understand when the coverage ends. So uh, for critical illness, um, some policies cover until 85 years old, but some policies actually cover beyond that. So it's very important for you to find out when the coverage actually would end. Thank you. That's a very comprehensive and quick crash course right, on how to be financially prepared. Um, yeah, I think the follow-up question on that is, you know, when should we really start thinking about that? And, you know, from a medical standpoint, of course, right, you, both of you have shared, start self-examination, um, you know, start, start all the mammogram checks, right, at different ages. Uh, so financially as well, you know, when should we start talking to our own, um, you know, personal um, insurance agents or financial advisors? on looking at early coverage all the way to critical illness coverage, when do you think it, uh, it's a good age to start? There's yeah. no good age. Actually, it's to start as early as possible, as young as possible for two reasons. The first reason is 
you know, uh, for insurance premium, as you know, that it increased according to age. So the younger that you buy, the cheaper the premium will be. Um, the second reason, which is the most important reason, is actually we want to buy when we are still insurable, when we are still healthy and insurable. Because as you know that for insurance application, it go through this process called underwriting. The insurer will assess your health, your health status and then decide whether they are able to provide that coverage to you. So it's very important that we start this as young as possible, even with small amount, start it as young as possible and start it when we are um, when we are still healthy. So do not delay in that decision making. Yeah. Okay. Great. So it's actually the same messaging, right? Same as um, breast cancer detection as well. Everything start early because you can, that's how you can save your breath, save your lives, right? Um, all right. Uh, we do have uh, really tight on time today. So um, if there's anybody in the audience or um, who are with us virtually who wants to ask questions, um, please feel free to also direct the questions to Breast Cancer Foundation. So um, really, thank you so much um, you know, to all the speakers. Um, we have uh, Emily, who's from FWD, Dr. Ramesh, um, who's uh, a consult consultant radiologist, um, and also Susan, who's the general manager at Breast Cancer Foundation. And with that, I think that's all the time I have um, for the panel. And handing it over to you, Jamie. Yeah, before we end today's session, we'd just like to show you a short film that was recently produced for Breast Cancer Foundation ahead of time. I want your right signal. Hey, did I tell you to horn? Turn off, turn off. Why well, you don't listen to mommy? You were on my mind long before we met. More to the side. Often with then a Now after that, you check the gears. Is it red? Try. Sit properly. What is this? Nothing this one? What's happening to the face? Nothing. Flip it. I know you're hurting. I won't forget. Signal left. There will Look at rear view mirror. Right. Hasn't I? Lay down my no, no. But there's a reason I am pushing you so Your main spoon, your knife, and your fork. So you won't. Signal light when you want to turn. Has a light when your car breaks down. Parking gear when you're in the park. Fan controller for the aircon. Pushing up a mountain. You'll find the other side. Standing by the ocean, I can't hold back the tide. You are the world, the sun, the moon. Right, thank you everyone. We would we'll like to invite you to join us at the photo exhibition and just feel free to read the stories of the cancer survivors themselves. Thank you.